Where's Fielder? He's gone to the dogs. Welcome once again to the Gone to the Dogs podcast. Man, I've been waiting for this interview ever since I watched the coverage of the UKC Tournament of Champions coming out of Greencastle, Indiana. Uh, what an exciting time it's been, the second year of the Tournament of Champions. I was privileged to be on the media team the first year, or last year, uh, and I got to watch it this year like most of you from from my easy chair. Uh, our guest today is the guy that won the whole enchilada. He won the whole deal, uh, took home a check in the amount of 50 thousand big ones so we're going to be talking to jr gray here in just a minute i want to take just a second to thank our our uh, the people out at w hunting supply that make this podcast possible buddy woodbury jason Duby, my buddy out there that kind of looks after me shannon my producer all those great folks out there they have great uh, supplies, anything that you'd need in the realm of coon hunting supplies for your, the hounds, for your apparel, and especially the electronic side of things, which is such an important part of our coon hunting uh, experience these days. And they back it all up with some great customer service. So there we go. We've paid the bills for the week, and we can get right into talking to our guest today, Mr. J.R. Gray. How are you, sir? Pretty good, buddy. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, man. It's really good to catch up with you. I think this is the first time you and I have really had a conversation, and uh, I've been kind of following you ever since you made all that noise back in 2018. Um, some people uh, live a lifetime or or hunt for a lifetime without uh, winning a world championship. And you go out and win two in the same year. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Lately, we get lucky every now and then. Uh, well, the old saying is, we'd rather be lucky than good, wouldn't we? Absolutely. Any day of the week. <laughs> oh, JR, it is a real privilege to be able to talk to you today and uh, uh, share your story with our uh, listeners. And this podcast is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, we're appreciating the consistency that we're getting episode after episode. It seems like, uh, you know, we're growing and, and, uh, so I know people are really looking forward to meeting you and, and hearing your story. Uh, I want you to tell me a little bit about who J.R. Gray is, your background, where you live now, where you were born, how old you are. Just stuff like that about your family. I know we talked just a minute ago. You've got a new addition that you can tell us about. So can you give me a little bit of backstory there, Jr.? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm 27 years old. I was born in Manchester, Kentucky, and I, I live now in London, Kentucky. And uh, I've been married for three years this May to Tara Gray. And about six weeks ago, I just had a little girl named Ellie James Gray. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's how old you said about six weeks now? Yep. She she'll be six weeks old tomorrow. Oh boy. I tell you what. And she's got daddy wrapped around her finger, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think she's got everybody wrapped. <laughs> I got you. Well now do do your fam you and your wife's families live around you there? Yeah, we, we actually we built a house back in nineteen uh I live about seven miles from my mom and dad, and we probably live about 10 miles from her mom and dad. We're kind of right in the middle. Okay. So, so it, you it works got, out pretty good. Yeah, so you got plenty of grandma support there when they uh, take care of <laughs> oh, the baby yeah. and all. A huh? lot of babysitters. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good thing. So were you born right there in that area, Jr.? Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, I was actually uh, born about, well, I've been raised, I'd, well, probably about seven or eight miles from where I live now. Oh, that's awesome. I always was kind of envious of people that, you know, got to grow up and, and, and still live in the area where they were raised. I was raised on the corner, our corner, on the edge of a little town in West Virginia that grow in, grew into a pretty good sized city over time. But I had a country right across the highway from me, but I was actually born in city limits. But I wouldn't want to go back there now and live there because of the way things have changed. But 
always been kind of envious of people to get to grow up uh, in an area and and so forth. Well, listen, what type of work do you do, Jr.? Well, I work for my father-in-law right now in a finance company. I've been there, I guess, about about three years now. I, I was driving a truck for my uncle, and I was working 80 and 90 hours a week. And uh, my father-in-law, he said, buddy, he said, uh, how about you just come work for me? You run them dogs and take care of my little girl. I said, well, that sounds like a plan. Man, such a deal. Where do you sign up for a deal like that, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that's great. That's great. So you work in a finance company, so you're you're yeah, I, behind I, the desk then. Oh, yeah, I do what I do best, just talk on the phone. Well, we're going to get to see some of that, <laughs> those skills <laughs> over the next hour or so. And uh, all right, well, let's talk a little bit about your coon hunting background. How did that all start for you? Well, I guess I, you could say I've coon hunted my whole life pretty much besides a couple of years. Uh, my dad, my papa, especially my uncle, uh, we've always had dogs, whether it's been coon hounds or rabbit dogs or, you know, I never have really messed with any squirrel dogs, but mainly just uh, mainly rabbit dogs up until probably the last seven or eight years. Well, did you do any competition hunting in the rat in, with the, with the uh, beagles? No, I was completely opposite. Uh, in the beagles, I didn't care if they had any papers. Uh, didn't care nothing really as long as I could go out and kill rabbits with them. I, <laughs> that was the main goal for me. Well, I got you. Well, you around London, Kentucky there, that's hill country, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 not too bad, but now you take about 10 or 15 minutes back toward Manchester, uh, where I was raised, and, and you can get in some pretty good hills. I see. Is there any coal mining in that country? Uh, they was, but it's it's about all gone. Now. That all you dried really up. I mean, they may be a couple right here within 30 or 40 minutes, but mm -hmm. uh, they're about dried up now. I got you. My grandparents were from eastern Kentucky, but they were up around uh, Paintsville and Van Leer and up in that way, up up toward uh, the Tug River area, up in that way. But, uh, uh, okay, so... Well, any, anyway, right around there where you are, is there any uh, old strip mines and that sort of thing? Do you hunt any yeah, of that kind yeah. of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we that's what we rabbit hunt a lot. But I mean, anymore, it's just it's just getting so hard to find places that you can actually hunt. Mm. Uh, I mean, we was losing spots left and right. It seemed like, you know, ten years ago, I could take you and you could hunt anywhere you wanted to, and then in the last, you know, three to four years, especially right before we got out of the beagles. Uh, I mean, it just got to where, you know, we had these three or four places, you know, if there was a house within a half a mile, it seemed like they didn't want you to be there. So yeah. we just kind of said, you know, we're just going to give it up and stick to coon hunting. Well, I got you. One thing about it, coon hunting, for the most part, is kind of a low-impact sport. I know all the years I lived in Michigan and hunted up there, uh, you know, there was a lot of areas that I hunted that I'm sure those people had no idea that there was any coon hunting going on, you know. Uh, of course, I had permission in the on the farms that I hunted on, you know. And, and but sometimes you know, dogs don't always stay stay on the patch of ground you set them down on, as you know. Right. And uh, but anyway, coon hunting takes place when most people are home in bed, or the all the sane people are home watching TV or. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're out there in the dark of night. Well, when when how old were you when you began coon hunting? Uh, well, I can you know we got pictures and stuff, and I can remember back when I was three or four year old. Uh, you know it was like a every Saturday night deal. My dad he he worked in the coal mines and he worked seventy and eighty hours a week. Whoa. And you really Saturday night was really the only night we got to go. But every Saturday night we was consistent. We'd go and lay out all night and get in you know seven thirty, eight o'clock the next morning four or five of us then mom have us back up at 10 o'clock headed to church yeah well good for her well that was always the way with me too back there in the day uh that you know we didn't we could lay out all night on saturday night but we we're still going to church on sunday morning no question about it but uh well that's great so so your dad was a coon hunter i mean a coon hunter and a coal miner then, right yeah well he was he was an off road mechanic he went out like the m triple sevens and dozers uh d11s and uh pretty much anything the the big tires i mean 
and tracks. He always done that. You know, I guess you'd say the surface mining. Uh, he was always gotcha. out there working mm-hmm. on something. Yeah. Well, I, you and I are quite a bit different in age. How old are you, Jr.? Twenty-seven. I'll be 27. twenty-eight next month. Twenty-seven years old. Okay, I am forty-eight years older. Than you. <laughs> got a little more experience than me. <laughs> I don't know. I got a lot of miles. I know that. Usually, when you get a lot of miles on a vehicle, you trade it in and get another one. <laughs> I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but uh, well, I'm sure you had some great experiences. Do you had? Did you have any uh, boyhood friends or cousins or or sib- siblings or anything that hunted with you when you first started? Yeah, yeah, me and my cousin Joey. Uh, I mean, we, I mean, we grew up together. We was first cousins. I was the only child, but I mean, you would never knew it because anywhere you seen Joey, you seen me. I see. Uh, I mean, we we was pretty much all through middle school, high school, uh, all the way up till now. Uh, he actually he's a lineman now. He don't get to go like he does, you know, used to. But every yeah. chance he gets to go, normally he he'll load up and go with us. If not, then I'll have his little boy with me. Uh, he loves it. He he actually loves them dogs. He Joey he was kind of more of a, I guess you'd say he liked turkey hunting, deer hunting. I was always the one that liked dogs, but him yeah. just enjoyed being with each other. So I'd go with him, and he'd go with me. Well, that's great, and uh, I know, and I'll give you a, uh, throw you a little bone here a little bit, you know, I know one time, I think it was John Wick, in the last year or so, wrote an article in American Cooner about why coon hunters don't smile in their pictures and all, and you're always smiling and looking like a pretty happy guy, does that kind of describe you, you you have a pretty uh, positive outlook on life? Yeah, man, I, I tell you, I've been I've been blessed way way more than I deserve. Uh, you know, I got an awesome wife, a healthy baby, uh, uh, great parents, got a lot of you know good friends, uh, people I hunt with. It's just, uh, and you know, that's the main thing. We pretty much look at these hunts. We're gonna go to them. It's kind of like a vacation for us. If we go win, you know, that's just a bonus. Uh, yeah. We don't do it for a job. We do it just because it's fun. And I think as long as you look at it that way, you'll be a lot better off. Well, I I have to agree with you, Jr. I've seen it both ways. You know, I don't know if you know anything about me, but I worked for thirty some years with the registries. I worked at UKC, PKC, and AKC, and uh, over the years, I've met a lot of hunters. And uh, uh, you know, I've seen it both ways. And the guys that like you with the attitude you have or seem to be the ones that uh, get the most out of the sport. And when it becomes a job or it becomes a must win situation, I've seen so many people down through the years, you know, if they didn't win, they didn't have a good time. And uh, I, I think that's probably not a good attitude to have. I think you'll, you'll have a lot more fun if you go to meet the people, uh, enjoy the dogs see the good dog work. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. I think, I think a lot of people, they get out there and some people, you know, financially, I think, you know, some people have, I mean, they'll go and, you know, whatever they make, they'll spend it the next weekend at a hunt. And if they don't win they're you know, they're going to be sitting pretty tight for the next week. And, and mm. I just think, I, I don't know. I think people get a little bit carried away uh, myself. I think, you know, they take the fun out of it. When they start making it a job, they take the, they take what it's really about out of the equation. I had a friend years ago named Les Rogers. He hunted blue ticks. He was from, I think, originally maybe Alabama. He lived in North Carolina for many years, and he worked for Purina as a rep for them. But he used to always say, boys, it's only a game, you know? And it is. It's a game that we play with dogs. It really shouldn't be. I had uh, had a plaque one time in my office that said, hunting's not a matter of life and death. It's much more important than that. But <laughs> it, that was more or less a joke, you know. But uh, but I, I think you're right. I think a lot of guys do take it way too seriously. And I know some of these fellows today that are paying these, well, they usually have a sponsor or an owner that's paying these extremely high entry fees that we see nowadays and of course the the return is extremely high as well but 
Uh, I just wonder how much fun they're having. I'd like to interview some of those guys and ask them, you know, has it become a job or is it something that you still enjoy, you know? But, uh, well, um, the, thank you for that background. Um, is it, are your parents, you, you mentioned that your parents live nearby and all. Does your dad still hunt? No, he don't, he don't hunt. I mean, he, he hasn't, I guess my dad actually, and I, I coon hunted, uh, in probably 10 years. Uh, but now I'll tell you what, he's, uh, he's the backbone of the, of the company down here. I mean, if I need a dog to go to the bed or if somebody needs to come breed a dog or anything and everything, my dad, he's, uh, he's a number one. I mean, he's right there. Uh, I'd call him any time of the day or night and be like, Hey, can you go, can you take this dog here? Can you go meet this guy or, or whatever? He, he don't ask nothing. He just goes. Uh, That's awesome. Let's give him a shout out. What's his name? Stanley Gray. Stanley Gray. And he lives in London. He lives, he lives in Manchester. Manchester. Okay. Well, there you go, Stanley. Uh, we want to be sure and give you the recognition you deserve there for yeah, sure. You, it takes a, when you've got a dog that you're trying to promote and, and you're gone and stuff, it takes a village of people, I mean, to try to, you know, mm. try to make everything work. And it, it definitely, I mean, if I'm going to a hunt or something, I mean, he's, he's right here, uh, taking care of everything while I'm gone. Well, I don't usually quote uh, Hillary Clinton on this podcast, but <laughs> but you're right. It does. It takes that support, and uh, you know, and obviously you got it. I ran into one of your buddies uh, out at um, in Mississippi uh, just a few years ago. A couple of guys that you know, I think, pretty good. Do you know a guy named Flop? Yeah, yeah. You he know Micah about, uh, Ayers. Oh yeah, that's the that's the president of the Black and Tan Association there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were out there. Um, I think. Well, I I don't know. Uh, we were out there. I think on the way to um, White River, but might have been Winter Classic. I think we were. I would say the Winter Classic. Yeah, that's what it was. Well, my buddy Nubbin Moore, who's a Black and Tan man at heart. But like most of us, they get around to hunting Walker sooner or later. <laughs> but they see seen the light. They see the light, that's for sure. But anyway, I sure had a nice evening. Got to go hunting with those boys and their dogs and all, and really, really enjoyed that experience. And I've seen where you've mentioned uh, Micah and and seen pictures of you and him uh, with your dogs and all. So that that's great. Makes me uh, envious a little bit. JR to want I, I tell you they ain't they ain't no better person than Mike Ayers. I just I mean, to be honest with you, I wouldn't even as far as in the coon hunting world, they probably wouldn't even nobody know who I was if it wasn't for Mike. I mean uh, <laughs> it's kind of a kind of a long story about that. Well tell uh, us about it. Well, me and Micah we started hunting together. I guess uh Superman was a two year old and Willie was just a Willie was just a one year old and uh all of his, I guess you'd say, black and tan buddies or whatever, they kind of quit hunting or, or slowed down, and, and Micah was looking for somebody to hunt with. And, and I was working at Walmart D.C. at the time. Well, every Thursday night, I would go up to uh, my buddy Tony Bowman's up in northern Kentucky. It's about two hours north. And really, they wasn't nobody hunting with me. I'd just drive up, stay all night with Tony, and we'd hunt to daylight after I got off work. And, uh, well, Micah, he kind of... You know, he's like hitting around. There's a boy named Stephen Desarn kind of got us hooked up. Uh, he went hunting with me a couple of times. He said, you and Micah, you know, you'd, you'd be a good team. And uh, we got to going up there, and, man, it just, I don't know how to say it. I mean, he's just like the like a brother I never had. Uh, but anyways, getting on to the story I was trying to tell you about. So uh, we go, and I get qualified for the world. Well, I, I had Willie qualify for the world, I think, two or three times. But uh, I never really competition hunted besides the local hunts. And uh, Mike is like, you need to go up here and uh, you need to go up here and hunt the autumn oaks. He said, I think you'd, I think you'd enjoy it. Well, the first, that's the, actually the first big hunt I was ever in. That was in 2017. And uh, we go to autumn oaks and I get Willie in the top 16 uh, the first year. So that kind of had me hooked on that place. That, you know, and oh, we got yeah. all them people up there. And uh, it's a pretty big deal. I, I enjoyed it. Uh you bet well, it is. Well, the next, the next, the next year, uh, we go up there, and 
Micah, he's like, man, you need to go to the World Hunt. I got Superman qualified. You got Willie. I said, ah, Micah, I ain't going to mess with it. I, you know, I just like to hunt. And uh, he kept on and kept on. And he's like, well, I'm going to sign Superman up. If you don't, you know, if you don't sign Willie up, I'm signing you up. You're going to go with me to the zones, please. And uh, he taught me into it. Well, we go up there to the zones, and, and I double Willie up. He gets Superman in. And uh, there's another guy in here named Murray Callen. We all three live about 15 minutes, 20 minutes from each other. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we hunt together. We, What's we in the water? Hey, time out here. What's in the water down there in that part of the country? <laughs> Buddy, I'd say I'd say there's a lot of stuff you probably wouldn't even want to know. What's in the water down here? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it it produces coon dogs. I know that for sure. Uh, but go ahead. So uh, so then we end up we uh, we get all three get in the top hundred of the PK or the I'm sorry the UKC world. Well, we go up or we walk in, you know, I, I don't take nothing serious. I mean, I'm always cutting up and joking, trying to have a good time. We walk in there and I said, man, I said, boy, look over at that trophy. It's got my name on it. He <laughs> said, do what? I said, yeah, go over and look at it. I was just kind of cutting up. Well, I think Micah and Eric, I think they get beat out the first round. And, uh, I mean, it was just pretty much, you know, he's like, you know, you guys stay in this or whatever. And here I am, you know, just cutting up. He said, you need to be a little more serious about this. And then once he gets beat, you know, he's my backup handler up there. And uh, he just keeps on, keeps on. You know, we looked up and won the world hunt. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later, we end up going to the AKC world and winning it. And that's kind of, I guess, what got me, I guess you'd say, hooked. Yeah, for sure. And I want to talk to you about both those experiences. But uh, there's no uh, doubt about it. Having a good hunting buddy, somebody to enjoy this sport with, it just makes it all that much better. And, you know, I've got a friend in Alabama. My listeners have heard me talk about him many, many times. Arnold Nubbin Moore. Nubbin and I have traveled now many, many miles together. We worked on the same team at UKC. He was a field rep. And that's kind of how I started out, too, way back. And, uh, yeah, so I understand what you're saying there about having a friend like Micah and all. Well, let's, since you've opened this door, let's, uh, we want to talk, we've got a lot of ground to cover, but of course we want to talk about these dogs. Um, the dog that you were hunting at that time, of course, is the dog that you call Gray's Rackham Willie, right? Yeah. Yep. And I believe he was what, four years old when you won the world hunt with him? Yeah, he uh, he turned four in June, and we won the world hunt in uh, September. Okay. Well, now, uh, first of all, I know that he was out of the only reason, dog. Tell me a little bit about, okay, you you had the female name Stylish Page, right? My uncle did. Oh, that was I, I your like uncle's claimer, dog. But, but it was my, it's my uncle's dog. Okay. Now, if I remember right, she was a dual grand UKC. Yeah, and she's is a PKC. She's a PKC uh, champion. Uh, okay. And like, but to be honest with you, I, if I knew what I know now, she would have. She would have uh, been top of the line. I mean, she never. She was another one. Uh, my uncle, you know, he would. Uh, he hunt the local hunts with her, and uh, he got a. You know, we took her up her one time on a free entry. I think he got her in the top twenty of the PKC world, uh, and that was the only time she'd ever left. You know. Kentucky. He took now, her to he took her to uh, the Spring Classic a time or two, and uh, took her to uh, took her to Labor Day Classic a time or two. And both times she got in, but other than that, she never left mm. pretty much the surrounding county. Now, what's your uncle's name? Jason Gray. He's the okay. I would say he's the one. I guess out of out of everybody, he's the one kind of got me into competition. Huh? Okay, so he has this female named Paige, and she's out of track man. And uh, Travis Brown's female, right? Yes. Okay. All right. I did an article on Travis. I think I mentioned to you, that to you earlier and really enjoyed that experience of talking to him and about his background. And He's been real successful with his dogs and his breeding program out there in Missouri. Uh, oh, I believe absolutely. he's in Missouri, isn't he? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so... What was the uh, who made the decision to breed Paige to only reason? That was my my uncle Jason. He uh, he said, you know, uh, Paige. We, we he, I guess you say us. You know, we like if it would if I had a dog, if it treed the far out of coons, if it didn't have a big mouth, it wouldn't interest me a bit. 
I, I mean, that's you. just, we've always had, you know, Paige, she had a big mouth, Willie, uh, and so on like that. And, you know, Willie's pups are the same way, but uh, everybody talked about how loud Reason's pups was, and he was a good-looking dog on top of that. And my uncle, uh, you know, Travis, uh, Travis Brown, he always, you know, he bred anything. It was all grand, and, you know, some people look down on it. Some people, you know, or whatever, everybody's got their own opinion about it, but uh, it's well, it's about the out. only way we have to actually document whether a dog is a coon dog or not. I'd say it can't hurt. You know, I mean, the dog make a, a, a Grand Knight champion. He had to tree some coons on the way. Absolutely. Yeah, you ain't going to you ain't gonna get this cakewalk. Right, uh, right. But that was that was two of the main reasons. You know, I, I don't know. He may have knew more about the, about the pedigree than I did. I, like I said, I never did really. Up until we had Paige, and and then we got Willie. I never did care about papers, uh, as like I said, I just like the king hunt. But uh, <laughs> he took her out there. We bred her. Uh, I think we met David there in, uh, I guess, out there in St. Louis, and got her bred. And then come mm-hmm. back home, and she had uh, six pups, two males and four females. Well, the other male died like two days old, uh, so that left you know Willie and then his uh, four other sisters. Oh, I see. So, uh, you, you, uh, did you pick Willie out of the litter or how'd that go? No, I picked, uh, Willie's sister, Paige. I picked her out and my uncle kept Willie. Well, when Willie was five months old, four and a half, five months old, uh, we had a coon pen or my papa did. And, uh, my uncle got Willie running tree and coons and cats and pretty much anything that would climb, he would tree at four and a half, five months old. Yeah. Well, I guess right before Willie got six months old, my uncle called me and he said, Hey, do you, you know, are you interested in this pup? He said, he's a ball mouth tree dog. And I, you know, I don't really like it. I said, yeah, I said, I'll, I'll take him. So, uh, so I went over and give $700 for him as a pup. And he's like, what, four or five months old, you said? Or... Uh, no, nah, he he was six, six months old. Six. Then. He mm-hmm. might've been seven. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, he had to start very... him in the coon pen and he, uh... yeah. Yeah. Did he go right on? I mean, did you start hunting him yeah, on the outside I mean, then? And... Pretty pretty much uh, ever since then, I was hunting him and his sister. Uh, at the time, that was the only two dogs I had. I just sold a, a dog I had before, uh, and uh, that's, uh, that was all I had to hunt. So whenever I was uh, hauling them, I had two 10-month-old pups, eight, nine, 10-month-old pups. Uh, I'd drive two hours, just take them up there, and uh, me and a couple of buddies of mine would go up there and hunt them pups all night. <laughs> so uh, now living there in that same area uh do you have to drive quite a ways to go coon hunting when you go uh i mean i can hunt around here and tree a couple coons but you can't really recast none it, either you get mm-hmm. you know you're getting you run into people's houses and stuff or uh you know the you get in places at the time you walk in there and back out you ain't wanting to recut i got uh, you yeah. So, uh, so pretty much about every time I go three or four nights a week, usually about what I hunt, I, I try to always get three, sometimes four. Uh, but we, we normally drive about two hours every time we go. Well, yeah, I, you know, for years, I, my breed was a plot breed and there was a plot breeder in a town called East McDowell, Kentucky, over in the mountain, Benny Moore. You probably never heard of him, Jr. but back in the day, he was had a lot, ran a lot of stud dogs and and all, but he always talked about having to go, you know, over around. I guess he'd go over around Harrodsburg and back over in that country, uh, you know, and hunt. Uh, those mountains is, you know, that's what I grew up hunting, and it is rough, and you don't, you know, you don't really have that opportunity like the guys in the flatlands do. But, no, uh, they don't. They don't have a clue what we got. <laughs> what we got to go through down here. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that's true for sure. Well, uh, you know, I went back and looked at a scorecard on Willie when he won that uh, UKC World Hunt, and I saw, you know, he scored three coons uh, that night, uh, and and just really dominated that cast. And there were some pretty good hounds in that cast, I know, and. What just briefly? Do you remember anything special about that hunt, winning the the UKC World Hunt with him? Oh, it was it was definitely a, a feeling like no other. You know, I 
the whole time I was just kind of like, you know, I, man, I'm just, I'm just happy to make it this far. And then, and then we'd win the next round. And I was like, you know what? I, I've done pretty good. This is my, this is my first time ever going. You know, I've had a couple of dogs qualify, but this is my first time ever going to the zones or going to the world hunt. And it was just like every round. I was like, you know, hey, if it's as far as we get, we've been blessed. <laughs> well, that combination sure worked for you and all, and so. Now, uh, you know, after winning the UKC World Hunt, now how much time went by before you won the AKC? Uh, it was pretty much like I think it was like two weeks. Yeah, two weeks later. Yeah. Now, where was the AKC hunt held? That it was year? in uh, northern Northern Kentucky. It was actually in uh, I think it was in uh, uh, Williamstown. Okay. All right. And your UKC win was up at Mount Gilead, Ohio, I believe, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. those places all ring bells to me. We had uh, the world hunt there at Mount G- uh, Gilead in 1988, and that was the only time a plot dog ever won the UKC world hunt, and he won it that year, a dog called Sizzling Heat. But, um, yeah, that's good coon country up there. Oh, uh, yeah, that's great hunt. Yeah. Well, what about that uh, AKC hunt, just briefly? How did that go? Buddy, it's been so long now, it's hey, hard to remember. Too, uh, too much water I, under the bridge, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you don't was, have I to mean, give me a recap on it. I mean, did you know, it was, that was just like the icing on the cake, I guess, after coming oh, yeah. off a uh, off a UKC win. That's that's just really unheard of. Yeah, I think uh, I think through that stretch, he'd won. Uh, we had it figured up, and, and I may be off just a little bit, but I want to think he'd won 16 or 17 casts in a row uh, from getting him qualified to at the RQE to going to the world to coming back home. And I think that we had like two pro classics uh, that we hunted in and then followed right up behind it. To, we went on to the AKC World and, uh, and won it. Well, it, it's an amazing story there. And, of course, his record is well documented. And... Uh, uh, you know, he's won all over uh, just about anything that you could win. Uh, but how did Willie do his winning? What, uh, just describe him a little bit. Oh, uh, well, he's just a hundred mile an hour. I mean, anytime he cut him loose, uh, he was going to be treated somewhere, usually within 10 or 15 minutes. Now, however long it took you to walk to him, that was a different story. Uh, <laughs> but he was just, he was just wide open and, uh, he just, he'd give you a hundred percent every time. Yeah, I know at one point there, Lane Denny made the decision to breed his world champion female to Willie, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we got, uh, there'll be two this month, and uh, I'm telling you, I got a little female right there. Well, me and we, me and my buddy Ellis Keene, uh, we're partners on her, and I, I tell you, I think she's going to be something special. Yeah. Well, you put a lot of black in there. Did those puppies turn out real dark? Well, I mean, with a lot of color? or? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, that- they was pretty much about all... Uh, they was pretty much all blanket back with yeah. red legs. Uh, two mm-hmm. of them kind of looked like a black, kind of like a black and tan, really, or or what we used to call a high tan. Yeah, exactly. You know, you'd have have mm-hmm. a little bit of have a little bit of white feet, and the rest of them that was uh, yeah. red legs and not, you know solid black back. Well, uh, you know, years ago, those those are preacher dogs. I think John Wick was the one that kind of made them uh, popular. The Brinkley's those are preacher dog. He was colored up that way, and. Uh, yeah, attractive dogs for sure, and a little different from what you see every day. But I always like those blanket back dogs. And uh, I, I noticed looking back on his pedigree, when you look back on uh, Reason and then also on uh, Page, uh, you go back in the third generation to Ball Stylish Hickory Nut Harry dog. Uh, so he's got that common ancestry, top and bottom. Uh, back there, of course, track man's in there, and uh, uh, do you, from what you've heard about any of those dogs, do you think he operates like anything in his pedigree? Or uh, how- well, I I couldn't really, you know, uh, I talked to C.J. Thomas and uh, and the way he described Reason, you know, described Willie a lot, but I would say Willie was probably a replica of his mother. Now, whether it come from track man or Travis uh, Travis's side or or mm-hmm. both. Right, but they was they was both. I mean, the same style. Well, I've got a a semen pup, a trackman pup, right now, was six months old, and uh, she's been a little bit of a late bloomer. She's not uh, really excited about uh, the the prospects of being a coon hunt 
uh, coon hound so far, but she's extremely smart and really a beautiful hound. I think she'll be just fine, but we're not pushing her. We're just going to let her develop at her own pace. You know, I have no aspirations of winning the world hunt. I'd have to get somebody else to handle her for me if I did. But at any rate, well, the Willie story is a great story in coon hunting, and, and he's he's obviously uh, been really good to you. Uh, is He's eight years old now, about? Uh, he'll be eight next month. I see. Okay. Well, I don't want to make it's him any older than he is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't want to talk about that. He's just yeah. like, he's my, like my boy here. Right? It's hard to believe he's already eight. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the doggone thing about coon dogs, or any dog for that matter, is they just really don't live long enough. Uh, so we have to be, you know, really enjoy them while we can because the yep. good Lord just lets us, uh, puts them on loan to us for for a little while. But, uh, well, so are you pretty happy with the way Willie's uh, reproducing? Yeah, yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, I, I definitely can't complain. Uh, you know, I think he's got roughly 55 to 60 night champions and grand nights. They've won roughly three, I'd say close to 350,000 now. Wow. Uh, That's... I mean, you know, he, and then, you know, we got, well, for one, I've got, I, I mean, I couldn't ask for, I got a better group of guys here as you do anywhere. I mean, I, 10 or 12 of us, it's, and they all got behind Willie and got a pup and, they really won't hunt nothing else but something off of Willie. Well, you know, and, that's uh, the secret. Don't mean to interrupt you, JR, but that's a, uh, a secret, I think, to any successful uh, campaign with a stud dog or breeding program is having those pups hunted, you know. And, and if you've got somebody that's doing that, man, that goes a long way in uh, improving what your stud dog can do. You know. Yeah, I mean that that's what it that's what it takes. I mean, you know, um, you know, Tony Bowman up there, uh I've hunted with him for I guess roughly I'd say ten, eleven years now. And uh, you know, he's just like a brother to me. Uh opened up all of his hunting places. Uh I mean I I couldn't think this guy enough. I mean he's he's top of the line and you know, once he got up we got these pups a little bit older and, and you know, Willie's got uh, uh he's got roughly eleven hundred pups now. And, uh, I mm. think I checked, uh, maybe, uh, I guess it's been close to a month ago. Really only like, I would say 560 to 600 of them is under a year old. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, you got a lot, you know, there, obviously there will be a lot of them that turn out well and all, you know, and, and comparatively speaking, you know, everybody in the Coonham world remembers Sackett Jr. Uh, or at least heard of him. There was a time that you basically could not go into the pages of uh, American Cooner magazine and turn a page without seeing a Grand Night Champion sired by him. Uh, and this was really, but you know, he he only sired, I believe it was seventeen hundred pups before he was killed on the highway when he was about seven years old. Now, if Willie keeps going, he'll have that many pups, I'm sure. Uh, well, uh, we hope so. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, well, that, that's that's great. That's great. Well, the reason why, and I don't know, I didn't have a podcast back when Willie was making all that noise, uh, you know, back in 2018 and all. I've been doing this now for a, about three years, coming up on three years, I think, uh, this month. But uh, I did want to talk to you about this uh, little win that you had here a couple weeks ago <laughs> up there in Greencastle, Indiana. Uh, you did win the UKC Tournament of Champions. Uh, they upped the uh, entry this year, and I think there was 90, what, six dogs that went to the final? 96 fight? dogs is what they took yeah. to the final. Mm-hmm out of the re, uh, zones or regions, they called them. And uh, when all the smoke cleared on Sunday morning, there was one dog that took home a check for $50,000. Do you ever imagine that you could have won $50,000 in a coon hunt? Uh, no, it, it's 
it's pretty un- unbelievable, you know. Uh, UKC is stepping their game up every year, and I think, you know, I can't imagine in 10 years what it's going to be like. Well, for sure, and I think this whole program was a brilliant idea for them. And, uh, you know, I hear, there's always detractors. You know, people say, well, yeah, but, yeah, but. But I think it came along for UKC at the time that they needed it. Uh, they're they're catching some bad press right now over their service, and I think that's a lot more the fault of the Postal Department that probably than it is UKC. But they've done a great job of of coming up with this idea of winning five casts and making your dog a champion and then qualifying for this tournament of champions. Uh, I want to talk to you about this dog. You call him uh, Willie's Connor McGregor. Now, I had to look that up because I'm not an ultimate fighting championship kind of guy. <laughs> But I had heard the name just kind of thrown around. But uh, how did you come up with the name for your dog? Well, to be honest with you, I never even uh, never even come up with the name. Uh, Levi Stevenson was the one named him. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, we went up there, and uh, Nick, Nick actually brought a female down named Izzy, which won, she won the 2018 PKC World. Well, yeah. right before she got to have pups, she had cancer or something. I'm not really for sure, but. She ended up dying like a week early before we, before we could take the pups from her. Mm. So uh, we go up and pleasure hunt with Nick, and uh, I think he took a pretty good liking to Willie. So when Abby come in eat, and he, uh, Izzy's sister, he sent her down, and we got her bread. Well, Nick picked the pup out that looked just like Willie, and then I get the white pup that looks like Abby. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's how you came up with him then. What yeah, uh, uh, and what's the background on his his uh, dam, his mother? Uh, Abby, she's a I think she's a platinum champion uh, owned by Nick Emil. Right, uh, right, up in Indiana, right? Yeah, right. And uh, Nick, I think he I, he owned Tracker at, and uh, he also owned her mommy as well. So I, you know, he's he's had real good success. He's got a female, a half mate to Connor which is named Gabby. I think she's won the Indiana State Hunt. Uh, she's, uh, I don't know, she's probably won ten or 15000 maybe $20,000 now, and uh, she's only just a three-year-old herself. Wow, that's, a, that's amazing. Impressive, for sure. Well, um, as, uh, explain, uh, let's see, let's go back. All right, uh, Connor, as a pup, uh, how, how, did, uh, how did he look early on? Well, uh, I had a I had another pup. Uh, I was hunting named Mac, and uh, Mac pretty much when he got up about two years old, he kind of he kind of had a blow up, and uh, everybody's like, you know, just lay the dog up. And every dog that I've ever started, you know, I've never bought a dog. I've always had one from you know six weeks old, six months old, and raise and train them. And I can say Willie done the same thing, and I had a dog before that named Bo, and Bo done the same thing as well. Uh, you know, you go from training a lot of coons with them to, you know, you're like, well, can this dog treat a coon? Mm-hmm. And uh, it seems like I always call them terrible twos. Well, Matt hit them terrible twos, and Connor was about 10 months old, and I'd never mess with him. And uh, I take him over. There's a guy named Jason Bullock here. He lives about 30 minutes from me. He's got right. a starting pen. And I take him over to the starting pen, and I said, as soon as this dog starts treating, you call me, I'll come get him, whether it's a week or a month. I said, I don't want him to sit in here and lose his mouth because, you know, he's, he's got a pretty good mouth. Well, he called me. I guess it's about five or six days later. He called me. He said, hey, you're going to, you're going to come get this dog. He's been treated all night. Mm. And uh, I go over there. Well, the next weekend, we leave and go to Ohio. And here I go to Ohio with a 10-month-old pup, take him up there. And the first weekend that, that he ever gets put out in the wild in the woods, uh, he trees, we go up there and he trees two singles. And mm-hmm. I'm just walking on air, you know, <laughs> on oh, the yeah. way back home. I'm fired up. You know, this pup, taking two weeks ago, we didn't know what a coon was. And now I've already, you know, he's tree two coons. And we bring him back home. And I pretty much just, just start hunting him, uh, hunting him by himself. And it's just like he knows what he was doing the whole time. Well, you know how uh, this uh, things just happen for a reason, uh, J.R., and we don't always know what those reasons are. But here you got a, a really standout dog in Willie. 
uh, you know, proven to the world and two world championships and everything else that top 16 at Autumn Oaks and all that that goes with it. And then he's getting into kind of you're breeding him and, and, you know, and that you're finding out that what he reproduces is his greatest value to you. And then along comes this young dog. And now that's the way it's supposed to work. You know, it doesn't always work that way. And you certainly have been blessed. And I think he, there got to be some credit that goes to the way that you handle a dog and the way that you spend time with the dog. And I want to jump into that just a little bit, and then I want to get back to talking about Connor and, and what he's achieved. Uh, what uh, What's your approach to puppies from the time you what, – what age do you like to get them to start with? Well, I'll, you know, I'll take them out there, and uh, and I like to let them, you know, if you, if you get a chance in the evening times when you get home or something, uh, take them out, let them run loose a little while, or, you know, if you got, like, over at my uncle's, we have a, well, we have about a five-acre, four-acre rabbit pen, and uh, just let them, you know, let them run loose. Just let them, you know, if they start mm-hmm. messing with rabbits or messing with squirrels or whatever, just kind of let them, you know, be a pup. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, once they get once they get started a little bit, I just kind of, you know, if we go up go up to Frankfurt or wherever we go hunting, I'll go up there and everybody will be turning their dogs loose left and I'll be over here walking this pup down a creek just hoping, you know, we can come across with him. Yeah. And uh Yeah. So I you're mean, you're uh encouraging that independence from the time they're young. Yeah, I mean they got and you know, uh the pups that like I said, the pups that I've had off Willie, normally, you know, some people they'll they'll even call me and say, Man, like this pup here it a running tree, but it, it won't pay attention you know my old dog they're kind of hard to train I'm like you know what's the what's the, well uh mine will be in here treating it'll be off over there by itself doing its own thing i said <laughs> well you want to sell that pup since there's something wrong exactly but, uh, well you know jr we've gone through uh that uh kind of uh sequence that's... with dogs you know, back when I was a kid and we were training dogs and young dogs and so forth, people didn't get too excited about a pup until he's two years old. Uh, and you wanted the pup to stay with the old dogs because there weren't many coon and it was hard country to hunt and all. And if the pup's over here in this holler, uh, fooling around and it's that one coon that that old dog struck the tree might be the only coon you tree that week let alone that that night and so you kind of wanted the dogs to stay with our young dogs to stay with the uh, the older dogs but that has changed dramatically and i think in the breeding of the dogs they just tend to be uh, more independent now and I, I, that's a product of breeding independence to independence. I think, uh, I don't think there's anything environmental really that would influence a, a pup to be more independent, but it's just a different world now, a different ball game. But, uh, yeah, I had to, I had to agree, you know, uh, from the pups that, and the dogs that I can remember when I was young growing up to now, I mean, the dogs I had up until, you know, till we hunted Paige and, Pretty much, we we started hunting Willie. Well, now if I had to go back and hunt them, I'd just quit. And at the time, I thought, you know, hey, we stick with death. Hey, we treat a coon tonight, or you know, we treat one. You know, we treat five this week or something. Used to, we'd get fired up over that. Now we're up there. If uh, if we go up there and hunt, we treat five or six singles. We're like, well, we've had a bad hunt. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's hard, uh, you know, when you're an old guy like me, you you don't want to get into that vein of saying, "Oh, everything was better back in the good old days," you know, or you boys all don't know what you're doing, you ought to do it like I do it. No, no, I don't want to be that guy at all. But uh, you know, guys really don't understand how much uh, more plentiful game is nowadays, even in some of those areas in West Virginia where I hunted, where coon were extremely scarce and we had to stock them. We had to order them out of Texas or uh, we tried Florida coons. They didn't work very well. But at any rate, uh, now, you know, all those areas, all those hollows and all got coons in them. So it, it has changed quite a bit there. So basically, you you just try to encourage them to be uh, uh, their own dog, and once they start treeing, do you uh, 
uh, with all those guys that you hunt with, do you get an opportunity to hunt the pup by himself very much? Uh, I mean, yeah, you do. I mean, they're going by always. I mean, every time we go hunting, there's a crowd normally. There's three, yeah. four, or five of us. We'll all have a dog apiece, and mm-hmm. we just get out there and cut them loose. It's just like a competition hunt every time. I got you. But, you know, they'll be scattered all over the place, and normally we'll have somebody to stay in the truck. And then it's just kind of like the, the bus driver or Uber driver, I guess you'd say. <laughs> we'll just, you go your That's way, me. I'll be mine. And we just kind of, <laughs> we just keep recasting and yeah. get around to the road, call somebody, hey, drive around here and get us. And, Oh you know, yeah, that's that's just how we hunt. Well, that's great, and it's great to have that kind of a group like that that you can enjoy hunting with. I I know a lot of times I hunted by myself in Michigan, uh, for two reasons. One, especially back in the days when fur was high, uh, you know, I I wanted to get out there and 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 skin some coons, and also if I had a young dog, I enjoyed watching them develop on their own, but. When it comes down to it, it's a lot more fun, you know, when my buddies from Virginia would come up and hunt a week with me or my friends from Indiana would come up and hunt quite often and all. It's just, I think uh, coon hunting is meant to be hound hunting, period, dating back to the old foxhound days years ago there in your state of Kentucky was always a, a kind of a group affair, you know, where guys like to get together and and all, and I, I hope we don't lose sight of that, you know, oh, of yeah. that aspect of it. If it was left up to me to go out here and turn a dog loose by myself, I mean, I love to coon hunt, but if I can't get out there and enjoy it with my buddies, I, 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 I wouldn't do it. I mean, that's just, well, I mean, now we can go out here and, and we're all hunting, and I may not see you half the night. I may be walking through her, you know, going to my dog or two of us to go to this dog and these couple dogs. And, uh, but as far as just me getting out and going by myself, I mean, I ain't afraid of the dark, but it just, that just don't seem like it'd be any fun yeah, to me. Yeah. And I would say to anybody that's listening to this is saying, well, you got to hunt by yourself to have a coon dog. Well, I'd have to ask that guy, how many world champions do you have in your backyard? You know, <laughs> but everybody's, it, got their, everybody's got their own opinion. But yeah. I, I mean, you know, you're, you're going to, if you like the competition hunt, and you know I, that's pretty much I, I I enjoy it and I love it now, uh, but I mean these dogs, people's you know everybody's like, well you got to hunt these dogs by themselves. I mean realistically, I would say as far as Connor being the box by himself, I know he may get cut loose once or twice when he was a pup, but as far as me just hunting him by himself, I'd say the dog ain't been hunting by himself in a year. He's only two year old. That that's really pretty amazing right there and. Uh... You know, uh, I want to talk to you about Connor. I know that I promised you that we wouldn't go all night with this podcast, although I think we could. Uh, and I hope that I can get a little bit of a, a, a promise out of you that you'll come back. Um, all right, let's talk about Connor and uh, about this Tournament of Champions and about how uh, you came to be fifty thousand dollars richer where did you hunt him in in the region uh how did that all go back or or what let's back up just a little bit at what point did you decide you were going to hunt him in the tournament champions uh well i guess it would have been the last year whenever i got my my five cast wins because i i mean i to me and i'm not saying it because i want it but to me the tournament champions is you know, that's the that's the hunt of all hunts. And the reason I say it is, is no matter if you got a million there backing you or you ain't got enough money, you know, you're on a fixed income and you draw 800 and whatever, $841 a month, uh, anybody can afford to go to it. So anybody that's got a dog has a chance to win it. It's not, well, you got to spend all this money because you don't. I mean, I think it was a $150 entry fee uh, for a chance at, you know, $50,000. So everybody has a chance. And uh, so I take Connor and sign him up, and we go over to the Lancaster zone, which is about an hour from me. Well, I got it out of Lancaster, and uh, I got some good buddies up north, John Perkins and Justin Burke, and uh, they have some, I mean, absolutely some of the best hunting you'll ever be in. It's hilly. It's not flat, but it's just good hunting, safe hunting. You don't really have to worry about nobody. Yeah. And uh, they take care of me, and, you know, they let me guide cast uh, right behind their house. Well, last year, 
I took uh, a dog named Willie B, and I guided him in there last year. I doubled him up and took him to the TOC uh, uh, last, uh, see, the top 64, and we got right. beat out up there the first round. And then this year, I got it both cast back, and then we won both cast. Uh, we won both cast again in the same in the same place. Well, that having a good place to go that mean that means a lot. And I know down through the years in in working on on the other side of the desk at all uh, major hunts, virtually all the major hunts at that time. Uh, you know, you always want to put the cast with the guide, and if possible, with the coon hunter. You know, we always like to have those hunting guides if possible because they're going to put the can, the casting coon for the simple reason that they want to win that cast as much as the other three. So uh, having a good place to go certainly makes a difference. Well, how did he look at, up there? Um, okay, so the, the first night we go up there, um, a red bone uh, tree's a coon. Uh, actually done a, done a great job. He's probably a half a mile in our tree in four or five minutes with a coon. Well, Connor was setting a mile tree, but I never could hear him. Mm. So these other these other two guys, we go in there and score that guy. He's got 75 and 100 on a coon. Well, these other two guys uh, strike and tree their dogs. Well, they end up moving, taking some minus. Well, it gets down. We go down here and run the eight. Well, the eight catches them. We walk the top of the hill, and we get on top of the hill. You can hear Connor, barely hear Connor through the country sitting. Well, I strike and treat Connor 100, 100 and a quarter. Time we get to him, there's only about 15 minutes left in the hunt. Well, we go score another tree, and by the time it's all said and done, we're up here next to the road. There's only six or seven minutes left, and uh, we end up, you know, we cut back loose. Nobody ends up making a tree or whatever, and that's pretty much how the first night went. Well, the second mm -hmm. night, we uh, we get out there and cut them loose. And uh, the one boy's black and tan dog goes down here. He's got a first and first. We get down there. He, he don't have nothing. He takes a minus. Well, he withdraws. Another boy's dog is, uh, I'm not sure. He's he's pretty much blowed out. Well, my dog's sitting eight tenths down a creek tree. We go to him. He's on a den. Well, when we get to mine, there's another boy's dog sitting in here treed. We go to him. He's got a coon. Mm. Well, the other the other guy in the cast, his dog has been struck for longer than an hour. So that opens up the strike and you yep. can see back to a hundred. Mm -hmm. So when I recut, when I recut, when Connor strikes back in, the other dog's back loose. I go in for a hundred, a hundred and a quarter. We go to him. He's got a coon. Well, we get him off that. There's about, I'd say there's roughly 20 minutes left at this time. Well, there's a boy's, there's a boy's, that guy's dog that treated the first coon gets treated again. Well, when his dog gets treed as we're walking to start the eight, by that time, there's nine minutes left. Well, I recut Connor because if this guy's got a coon, he's going to beat me. So when I recut Connor with nine minutes left, he goes 900 yards. And right before we get to that guy's tree, Connor loads up tree sitting in there. And as soon as we see that that guy's got a coon, I had to treat Connor with three minutes to go. We go to Connor. Connor's got another coon. Mm. And the hunt's over. <laughs> down to the wire yeah yeah it was it was a great hunt we had yeah. you know we had good we had good guys uh, both around had a good time uh it's definitely a great experience yeah so you got cast wins both nights at the region then with him yeah 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 well that's first good. night i had 225 and the second night uh let's see i had uh 225 and 75 i had uh 400 yeah 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 that's good solid scores all right, so what was it, a week or two weeks in between the well, three? Well, so we, we, leave, we leave the tournament champions, and the next week we go to the Super States, and I ended up getting him in the final six of the of the junior Super States. So he and, gets uh, in the final six in yeah, the junior. Yeah, the two-year-olds. Yeah. What did that pay you? Uh, I think it paid 800 and uh, we come back home, and, where I just had this newborn. You said $2,800, right? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, I think if I'd have won that cast, uh, if I would have won that cast, that would have put me at, I think, 7000 is what it paid the last place, or 6000 I ain't really for sure, to be honest with you. Well, so, so you didn't really take any time off between the regions and, and the uh, finals? 
No, I we the regions was uh, I think the first and second or second and third, and then right. I turned around, took off Sunday and Monday, and I left for the Super Stakes on Tuesday. <laughs> you don't let any grass grow under the wheels of that truck. You know? right. <laughs> no, that's for sure. We we try to you know if we got a dog, uh, we try to we try to make a. I like going to the tournament champions, the Super Stakes, and then I'll uh, I'll you know I'll hunt a couple local hunts, and, and then we'll go. Uh, we try to go to Autumn Oaks every year, yeah. And then we'll try to we'll try to get a dog qualified and try to make a run at the UKC World. And then if I got a foul dog, I'll be at the foul Super Stakes, and then I hunt the PKC World. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's a pretty, pretty full calendar right there, for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, there's about there's about six hunts. You mm-hmm. know, we yeah. go to the Winter Classic, then the Spring Super Stakes, and the TOC. That's three, and then you got Autumn Oaks, the the foul world or the foul super stakes if we got one and then the pk or the ukc world and then the pkc world that's about seven hunts altogether there i believe yeah 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 okay so let's go to the finals and talk about that a little bit and then i'm going to let you go all right so uh the finals the first night uh we cut the dogs loose this boy's blue dog does a nice job he's got 225 on a coon we go to the slim dog he's on a den and then Connor gets split in between them, and uh, Connor's got a coon, which gives me, uh, I want to think I got uh, 150 or, or I think I got 175 or 200 on it. I can't exactly remember. Right. Uh, we recast him. The blue dog and Slim's right-handed. Well, Connor goes left-handed the opposite direction. Uh, he gets in there and starts locating around, and he just sounds to me like, he, and looking at him on the garment, he looks like he's trying to win tree, so I'm kind of letting him settle in. They put the stationary on me. Well, the slim dog comes in and uh, comes in and covers him. And as soon as he does, I treat Connor. Well, they're treed for probably, I'd say, five or six minutes together. And then Connor just, you know, rolls out. Well, we end up walking in there. You know, Connor had a coon. I don't, don't really know why he left. We never heard him or anything. Heard anything get rough. He just, but anyways, so we, we get that dog off the tree. Connor's treat again. We go to Connor. Connor's got another coon. Well, by that time, Slim is retreed. We go to Slim. Slim has a coon. Hmm. And then once we get Slim off the tree, Connor's setting uh, 0.82 in somebody's yard tree. So I, I tell the judge, and I'm like, hey, we need to get out there this road and walk this road straight down. And uh, once we get to Connor's tree again, he's getting his uh, third coon. So uh, at that time, I think uh, there's roughly about 32 30 minutes left uh we have to walk back to the last place we heard the the stony dog which he was struck for a quarter and uh or he may have been struck for 50 anyways he withdraws and i think there's 27 minutes left we recut the dogs and uh, slim and the blue dog goes left and connor just kind of blows out straight in front of us well so when slim gets treed that kind of puts you know pressure on me i need to get treed uh well connor comes treed with probably nine minutes to go uh, he puts a stationary on Slim. He treats Slim. So as soon as he treats Slim, I treat Connor. And uh, the guy gets the blue dog treat in. They go score Slim. That puts Slim in having a coon. So uh, once we get the Connor, if Connor don't have a coon, Slim wins the cast. Well, we get the Connor. Connor's got his four single. And uh, the hunt's over on the early round. Uh, <laughs> coon well, tree or for so, sure. Yeah. So hey, we go, does, we let, go, let me ask you real what, quick. Has he got that big mouth that you like? Oh, yeah. He's, yeah, yeah. he's got it for the most part. Uh, I think the people hunting with him, man, if anything, you can ask them. They was like, man, that dog, you know, they they couldn't believe when I treated him in at the end of the hunt. He was uh, eight tenths. They was like, he, he just sounded like he's like 400 yards. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, go so, ahead with your story. So the, the late round, I draw a flop, the guy you was talking about earlier. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's one of the guys that I wouldn't want to draw just because, you know, I, he, he's one of my buddies. And, and it sucks that, you know, I, if anything, I just want to draw him maybe in the finals. Uh, so we get out there. We cut the dogs loose. Uh, this guy's dog does a nice job. He's got uh, 200 on a coon. Uh, he recuts his dog. We go to Connor. Connor's got a coon. Uh, I, think I, I think I struck for 50. So that put me at 175. And then we recut them. Connor gets treed again. No other dogs got treed yet. We go to Connor. Connor's got another coon. Um, so I think that put me at a quarter, 
or 150 and 175 that put me at 325 well yep. we get him off of that this one guy's dog's treed we go to him his dog's slick he takes a minus by that time connor's retreat again well we go to connor connor's got another coon we haven't heard nothing out of the bugs dog and we haven't heard nothing out of out of nitro well by that time i think there's there's roughly 45 minutes left in the cast and uh time we walked back to the last place we heard bugs because you know we had to keep following connor uh we get back out there start to eight uh bugs withdrawals well we had to cut back loose when we cut back loose there were roughly about 30 minutes left i think and uh flop he hears nitro he strikes and trees nitro nitro and we go to him and nitro's got a coon well connor's retreat again but i don't have to tree him this other guy he trees his dog so I don't have to tree him. And by that time, they, I don't think there's enough time to put the stationary on the wall anyway, mm-hmm. uh, which which at that time, it wouldn't have mattered. If we'd have walked in there and if he was slick, I still won the cast. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so while we walk in there to Connor, the hunt's over with. Connor has another coon, uh, but we didn't score it. And then that brings us up to Saturday night. Yeah. Well, Saturday night. Okay. You know, now, let's and, stop real quick right here. Okay. What about that hunt? What about the way it's organized? What about the place they have it and all that? What was your impression about it? Well, of course, you've been there two years now. Well, uh, if I had to say, if you was ever going to take anyone and try to get them into coon hunting, that would be the hunt to take them to. Yeah. But, you know, it, it would definitely spoil them. I mean, they got, you know, a nice venue. Uh, I mean, they make you, you know, they make you feel, you know, they make you feel like, you know, you've done something. Yeah, uh, you for know? sure. Yeah, we can't say just, enough uh, about Alan and Trevor and and that whole crew, that whole effort there at UKC that they're doing with the tournament champions. I got to witness it firsthand last year, uh, and from the inside out, and really can't say enough good about it. And I just wanted to know, you know, kind of what you thought about it. Uh, okay, let's go into the final night then. All right. So Saturday night, uh, I draw Nick Emma with Gabby. And uh, so that put a half brother and half sister draw on each other. They both mm-hmm. have the same mommy, but they got different dads. Uh, so uh, we get out there, we cut them loose. Uh, the dogs kind of go back right handed toward the road. Well, Nick Nick's dog gets treed. She well, she throws a couple locates, and the dogs are close. He trees her. Well, she moves on. Well, her and Connor's both kind of going the same direction back toward the road. But we, you know, we run up there to the road and get in the road just in case one of them pops out. Well, Gabby, she shoots across the road. Well, Connor goes back around and goes down the field edge then pops in there and gets treed. Well, we go to Connor. Connor's got a coon. Uh, we get out in the field, recut him. Gabby, you know, she barks. We recut Connor. Uh, well, Nick trees Gabby. I'd say she has to be well over a mile. Uh, and, you know, it's just a 90-minute cast. Mm. So uh, we go to Gabby. She's got a coon. And by that time, you know, Connor set and tree, but I ain't really, you know, we're almost at that. I think we got up to what 1.8 miles from him, almost two miles as the crow flies from him. Uh, mm. the time we, time we walked back and I had to treat Connor in, there's only 36, 37 minutes left and he's done been treated. You know, he's done been treated on his second coon for roughly, I'd say 35 minutes or longer. Uh, so mm. we go score him and we're looking at the tree when we first walk in there. I'm like, man, this don't look good. And uh, I walk around, I look, and literally the trees are about four foot apart. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. The coon is sitting in the tree, you know, the other tree. Well, I look up there and just so happened, Connor's tree, there was a big limb that went from Connor's tree into right where the coon was laying at. <laughs> I mean, you know, no question about it, the grizzly bear could have crossed over. Uh, but I was just thinking, I thought, man, that's a tough break right there to be that close. Uh, and then we got him off of that, recut him. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think Gabby, she got treated again. And it was, it was only roughly about 10 or 11 minutes left. Uh, that time we got him and scored him and all that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So then that was the early round in Saturday night, right? Yeah. 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 So that was, you just had the head to head round. And yeah. Now, and that was only a 90 minute cast. Yeah. And now you're in the final. And then, uh, so the final round, we cut loose, and uh, Connor opens up. Well, I strike Connor, and then Nick, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 
Joe strikes Dom. Well, the judge, the wind was blowing terrible. Well, the judge didn't hear me. There was two other guys standing behind me. They both heard me, but the judge didn't hear me. So we kind of had, you know, a question about that. Well, as soon as Connor dies, treat I tree him. Then Joe trees uh, Dom right behind me. We go down there. They got a coon. Well, Piper's sitting probably 150 yards split from him. She has a coon. Uh, once we get Piper off the tree, uh, I'd say it's probably only a couple minutes. Connor's retreat again. We go to Connor. He's got another coon. So uh, we get Connor off that tree, recut, and we're walking back down there trying to hear where the last place last place Piper was at. We get back down there, Dom's tree, probably eight tenths through the country. Well, we go to Dom, and he's, I mean, he caught a terrible break. I mean, we go in there, and his dog is up a stump, or just a little, you know, probably about eight foot tall. And there's a coon sitting probably 10 or 15 foot right behind him, just up a bush. Uh, knowing the dog probably wind treat him or something, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. And it just you know, it just you know how these hunts go. You you got good breaks and bad breaks. Right. That was just a, that was just a bad break for him. So we get him off of that. Uh, we walk back a little bit to where we heard Piper. Well, Connor gets treated about four or five hundred yards uh, across the river. So we go over to Connor, and at that time, uh, we had to get we had to get away. That river gets pretty deep, mm. but uh, we we get over to Connor, and Connor is on a den tree. And on the and then the tree his tree lays into was also a den. So we squall. We can't never really get nothing to get nothing to come out or nothing to look. So by that time we come back. There's about I think there's roughly 45, 50 minutes left in the hunt. Well, uh, Dom is treed in that time. He trees Dom. We go Dom. Dom got a coon. Well, I'm sitting at 475 plus, and uh, at this time Dom's got 50 minus, and Piper's only got 175 plus. So I'm, you know realistically they're gonna have to both of them's gonna have to treat at least two coons to beat me yeah so i'm gonna leave mine on a leash you know he's almost at this point i know you know they can always look better but you know it's at this time you know he's made 14 trees up here this weekend and he's had 50 or he's made 15 trees and he's had 14 coons so uh so at that time we walk back out of the field and we get down there i think when we had to recut out of the eight catches piper uh there's about roughly 10 or 11 minutes left. Well, Dom just flies down there and gets treed. We go down there in his zone then. Well, Connor's sitting, at that time, he's sitting about 700 yards. Uh, I hear him opening up, you know, working a track. And right there at the end of the hunt, he gets treed. Well, I don't have to tree him. And after the hunt's over, I walk in there to him, and he has another team. That you didn't have to score. That I didn't have to score, yeah. And that's a smart move because why gamble, right? Yeah, I mean, they right. wouldn't. They wouldn't no need to. I mean, mm -hmm. now for granted, you know, both of them, you know, Piper, she ended up taking 75 minus. So that put her at 100 plus and that put Dom at, at 100 plus. Uh, so, I mean, really, if I would have gambled and took the minus, I still would have won. But there, there's no reason to. I mean, that's exactly. Just been dumb. exactly. I mean, I guess, you know, we never know a dog could trip off awesome them and get scratched. Sure. For, sure. for all that goes. So they wouldn't no need to. Right. Right. Well, that's that's pretty great. Well, now at that point, then it kind of sinks in that your your bank account's taking a a pretty good uh, pretty good uh, boost. Well, you know, just to be honest with you, and, and people's going, you know, be like, oh, he's crazy or he's just full of it. But really, I mean, you know, that that win and that title that was just as good as as any money would ever be. That money comes and goes, but just to know that, hey, you know. Connor won the tournament of champions in 22. That that means a lot to me. Well, you know, you hit it on the head there, Jr. And I don't think anybody uh, that's not involved in the sport would understand that. But I said many, many years ago that uh, if I had a motto, it's recognition is the name of the game. Just getting our dog recognized for what. Uh, what he's able to do and able to accomplish is really more important than the money. Uh, yeah, and I mean, you know, like, a, for example, you know, with Willie, you know, I won the won the UKC World Hunt, all right? The right. next year it paid $10,000, and everybody's like, man, that sucks. And I'm like, no, it, it really don't, you know? Just to say we won a, you know, won a World Hunt well, together, sure. that, was the, that, was the, that was the main thing. I mean, that's... 
Well, That's look at the dogs well. that you joined on that list. You know, when I was at UKC, we had a perpetual trophy that sat in the lobby of the office. And on that trophy, it had a little plaque on there for every dog that won the UKC World Championship. And I don't know if they still have that or not. But to have your name alongside the Beaver Lake Magic, the Hillbilly uh my, uh, you know, Hillbilly Mac and, and all of those dogs down through the years that won that hunt, you know, ever since 1978 is an honor and uh, something that most coon hunters will never achieve. And so I, I get it. You know, I get what you're saying. Well, it's great that you, uh, that you won the tournament champions with a young dog out of your stud dog. And, and, uh, so what's the plans for the future? We're just hopefully, you know, we, we're going to keep pegging along and hopefully we got a, you know, a few more good wins left in the tank and, uh, you know, we'll just see how it goes. Well, have you bred Connor yet? No, no, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not going to Willie. Willie's taught me a lot about the coon hunting world. And I tell you, uh, you know, it's 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 awesome owning a stud dog, but I tell you, I enjoyed really way more hunting than I did breeding or breeding <laughs> now. Well, that's when the work starts. It's when you make one and and pub the public uh, gets wind of it, and that's when the phone starts ringing, and that's when the, uh, your wife probably wonders what what happened to her husband. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, people, you know, people, everybody wants a stud dog, and and, uh, and it is. It's a blessing. It's an awesome experience. Uh, but I think, you know, you kind of get to where, you know, you're like, you know, I enjoy coon hunting a whole lot more than just than just breeding dogs. Well, you're a coon hunter. That comes through, uh, J.R. Uh, you've got a great background. You've got a great support group there, not only your family, but your friends in that area. You got a beautiful wife and a new baby now. Uh, how much better can life be, right? Oh yeah, I mean, and 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 like I said, that the main thing is, I mean, I got, and I'll say it, and I'll tell everybody this. I mean, Willie or me or anybody, I mean, I got some of the best friends as far as in hunting you could ever meet. Yeah, I mean that's and that's the main thing. I mean, you know, like I got, to, you know, I, I hunt. This is just say like a weekly basis you know i hunt with tony bowman micah ayers uh ellis king casey maggard kevin gay uh you know ben hill uh there's just a there's a lot of us that gets out zach norris and kendall norris they're always you know micah always makes a joke he's like well you know if the bus ain't full you know i'd like to go with you tonight and uh, <laughs> anybody that ever anybody that ever calls me, you know, I'm like, hey, I ain't, I ain't never told anyone yet, you know, hey, we ain't got no room. I just always say, well, we got four or five going, but we'll, we'll make something happen. You know, we'll <laughs> we'll we'll make room. It it's all about the fun, anyways. So you, you start getting too serious about it, and you have bad nights, and it seems like every time you you plan for one thing to go one way, it'll blow up in your face, and you'll go another. Mm-hmm. So, well, in my experience over the years, you know, uh, I've I've met all kinds of coon hunters and I've, I've experienced all kinds of different attitudes with coon hunters. And I say that your attitude and the way you're approaching the sport is the right way. And if you're a young hunter out there listening to this podcast, you can uh, learn a lot just by listening to Jr. here and his uh, attitude toward the sport. And Jr., it's been great to spend this time with you. Uh, we have spent about an hour and 20 minutes now, which I promised you we'd, we'd wrap it up in about an hour. <laughs> but uh, I'll just have to owe you for that extra 20. And, <laughs> oh, that ain't no problem. And, and I do deeply appreciate you uh, coming on the Gone to the Dogs podcast. You're a class act. Uh, you've really given us a, a good uh, uh, hour and 20 minutes here of uh, entertainment and and, uh, and go and ahead. I, and I was, also, I was going to tell you too. I, I got to throw this in there. I got to give a, give some shout outs to some boys, uh, Eric Emery and Stephen Emery, Adam Trusty. Uh, you know, well, not only with Connor right here. You know, I met them boys about, I guess, close to two years ago now. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I'll tell you another another thing. I think it helps these dogs is uh, 
you know, it makes it nice when you got somebody like them guys up there. You know, last year in, in May, I sent Connor up there to Eric to hunt. So pretty much, you know, Connor gets to hunt down here in these hills and hollers, kind of figure things out. We sent them up north to Eric and Trusty and uh, Steven right there, and uh, they hunt them for probably two or three months out of the year for us. Yeah. You know, gives a dog, you know, take you take a dog at, that ain't never got the opportunity up there. Well, when you go to the spring, you know, go to Greencastle, you go up there to the spring super stakes or the uh, autumn oaks or the world hunt, it's different for them dogs. I mean, oh, it, yeah. it really is. And and I, I had to throw them, them in there. And uh, also, I want to thank, you know, uh, Kevin Cook and uh, Braden Jones and Wade that they're, they're up there in Greencastle and Cody Carter, uh, you know, going back again that's where you know i guess if i i guess the biggest thing is you know like i said going back is as you find these friends you know and kevin them they opened up their homes and him and tenderfoot and uh they took us you know pleasure hunting give us a place to keep our dogs and and stuff like that man that, that goes a long, long way and that's yeah. that to me that's the that's the main thing about these hunting you know uh you meet you meet so many good people you will have a few bad eggs but for the most part I mean, you meet some, you meet some great people and, and people that you would never knew these dogs. You just, you can't believe where they take you. Well, that's for sure. And I can testify to that, Jr. And I think a lot of the, uh, you can always judge a guy by the, the company he keeps and by his friends. And I know that those guys would say the same thing about you, my friend. It goes both ways, you know, and well, I certainly want to wish you nothing but success going forward. Uh, and uh, that you, uh, Connor, will will exceed your expectations as a competition dog, and and then maybe someday down the road you may decide to 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 stud him out the way you have Willie. But it's been a great visit with you, uh, and uh, thank your wife for sharing you here. I know that you're usually out uh, hunting all that you can and that sort of thing. And this evening it, it's really been great to talk with you jr wish you nothing but success uh going down the road uh it's the time of our podcast that i usually uh call up my old buddy over in the hills of pennsylvania the 85 year old coon hunter fred moran we'll be speaking to fred in just a moment but uh jr i want to thank you once again i wish you nothing but the best all right, man. I appreciate it. It was good talking to you. I really enjoyed it. Well, I'm glad you did, and it's very enjoyable for me, too, and we'll do it again, okay? All right. Sounds good. Have a good one. You, too. Well, how are you doing, Fred? Oh, pretty good, Steve. Wore out. Catch all. Too much hunting. Not enough sleep. <laughs> but I'll give it a good try again tonight, because we're supposed to get a lot of rain tomorrow. Well, have you had a lot of rain up your way? Quite a bit, quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I hunted in a woods two nights ago, and it was supposed to storm late, but we quit right just as it started. I went back, the, uh, or that was two nights ago, or three, and I went back in the same woods last night because I wanted to see something there. Man, we're lucky we got out because on the gas line, there was about three trees, uh, at least telephone pole size, that the wind blew down overnight. And really, if they were to hit someone, they wouldn't be there tomorrow. But well, I saw that you it looked okay. Yeah, well, I saw that you were having some bad weather up that way. I had to call or text my buddy Randy Smith up there. Uh, I don't know how far is he from you. He's there north of Pittsburgh in Catanning. Yeah, that's where the Randy lives. Yeah, yeah. How far is that from you? Oh, about forty miles. I got you. Okay. Well, I knew he's, you guys. He's were... got some good hunting. There. If you go north of his place, a little north uh, west, and that's some of the best hunting in Pennsylvania. It's all level. A lot of coon, yeah. And ninety nine percent of the farmers up there want you to get them all. Yeah, uh, they are a nuisance up there. Yeah, I enjoy it, hunting up there with him. I go up a couple times a year. Did he ever yes. mention? Did he ever mention a town named Slippery Rock? Uh, I've heard of Slippery Rock, but uh, well, isn't that where the, the college, college is? Yeah, yep. 
Penn State, That's, right? Uh, yeah, no, not Penn State, no? but uh, Slippery Rock Slippery College. Slippery Rock College, yeah, okay. Yeah, and there's another one, yeah. Grove City. Right. But that's some of the finest coon hunting in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, I should be telling that everybody. Be that's happy. right. You'll have to get a, <laughs> an appointment if you want to well, go. <laughs> uh, that's one of the few places you can go in Pennsylvania and run into somebody coon hunting. Most of the time you never run into anybody, but yeah. you will up there. Yeah. They come from Ohio and everywhere else. I got you. Uh, yeah. Like you say, it's some terrific hunting. And, uh, just about anywhere up that way, it's a lot better. Mostly because it's level like Ohio, parts yeah. of Ohio, Indiana. They're good hunt. People yeah. always ask me, what's the best place I ever coon hunted? And I've been in uh, probably every state but about 10 and plus Canada. Uh, admitting Canada... I always thought the best coon hunting for most coon and pretty easy hunting in comparison was Michigan first and Iowa second. Uh, in Iowa, one time, me and John Chilson, when he was living, we were hunting out there. This was a, a good 40 years ago. I think we saw, I don't remember exactly right now, 21 or 22 coon in two and a half hours. <laughs> and th now a lot of trees had, you know, doubles, triples stuff, but that's, that's still mm -hmm. a lot of coon, no matter which way you look at it. Do you, rem Michigan, do you remember where you were hunting out there or? or yeah. yeah huh. I hunted with a guy that used to, he's well known. No, I can't think his name now. He had a red dog. He used to advertise Spoon River Andy. I know his name right away. If I heard it, he lived in Iowa. But just over the Missouri line, this was north of Kirksville, Missouri, but in Iowa. And uh, a guy came here and bred a female to my old magic dog from Iowa years ago. And we were out there at a red bone hunt at Kirksville. And we went up with them one night and just went coon hunting. And that's how we saw all them coon. I know the guy's name that had the Andy dog. That's a shame. I can remember the dog, and I can't remember him. But he was well known back in, I say, that was in the 60s. 60s yes, so, uh, yeah, and then I do remember that dog very well, uh, Fred, because some fellows there in southern West Virginia ended up buying that dog and that bringing right? him down there, a guy named Kenneth Harper, and a guy named Chick Scarborough. I, I knew Chick. I uh, bought a dog off him. Okay. Uh, Chick had I, the Blakesley's uh, Northern right. Chief dog at have, one time. He used to advertise it occasionally at stud. Yes. Yeah. yeah well, I those guys Chick. were right there in my hometown. So we oh. had, uh, as you mentioned, red dogs. Uh, I remember uh, Bruce's Big John. They bought him and brought him in there. They had uh -huh. Spoon River Andy. They had uh, Blakesley's Northern Chief. They also had uh, Tucker's uh, Ruby female. Okay. Uh, and she was a really you know nice them red dog. dogs as good as you know them plot dogs. <laughs> well, you know what? People down through the years have kind of said, man, how you know about all this? I said, well, when you're a fanatic about coon yeah. hunting and you grow up with it, you read everything you can get your hands on about. You're right. I used to read them. I used to. First book I ever got was a full cry. Uh, me and a couple buddies was riding around. We were about 16, and we were riding around, and we spotted a black and tan coon dog in the yard. This is about 50 miles away from where our coon club is at the present time, up in ago. And I said to the guy, stop, stop. I said, I'd love to talk to that guy. We talked to him, and he told us all about his dog and so forth, and he gave me a full cry. And uh, uh, I never even heard of it before. Man, I read that thing 32 times. <laughs> and I found out where to get it. Naturally, uh, it was inside, and I got the American Cooner shortly thereafter. But yeah. uh, that was my first introduction to find out there's other people besides me that got coon dogs. Yeah, that's and, right. And uh, 
That was our lifeline. That's for sure. Yeah, that was our lifeline to the whole country right there in the pages of that magazine. And I got to meet Mrs. Walker in person. Mm. She was a good person. Absolutely. uh, And uh, like I say, she was a friend to every Kuna. And then that same guy, I believe it was him, he gave me some old fool cries that were I believe it was 1943. Roy Rogers mm. was in there, Kunan. Yeah. And it, it showed uh, him and his buddies, uh, all the ones you see in the movies. And I, uh, about two years ago, when I sold my house and moved, I had all them magazines. And I put a little ad in the, uh, one of the magazines, and I says, uh, uh, about 150 magazines. I know I give this guy, a guy in Pennsylvania came down and got them all. I know he took over 350 home, every what? bit of that. I didn't realize I had that many. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, well, those uh, are great just to go through. I've got some oh, old yeah. ones I, here myself. I yeah. used to pull one out every once in a while so far, but Packy, when he was sick, I don't know if you knew it or not. My wife took care of him for about six months. We uh, had the downstairs built into a game room. When coon hunters came, they had a own shire and everything else downstairs. Well, Packy stayed there. I'll bet he read every magazine I had. I'd, he'd get <laughs> up in the morning and read till dark and read yeah. all them magazines. Yeah. That's so, awesome. That's awesome. I loved. I love them. I I think at one time I was keeping every copy of Coonhound Bloodlines uh, uh-huh. that I had written an article in, which right. was basically all of them all the years that I was at UKC, and I still have those magazines in storage. I need to do something with them. Uh, I that know becomes what you mean. yeah. When when we get to our age, uh, Fred, we have to start thinking about what we want to do with this stuff, well, you know, that we've been accumulating all Here's all the thing. Years. When I moved from my home that I ha- I built at home, I didn't. Uh, I had builders build it, but I paid for it. Anyhow, yeah. um, uh, my home was 35 years old when I uh, moved out of it. And uh, uh, what I was going to say, there was... Um, uh, so much stuff that I had that I didn't realize I had, and I'm still at that place. I got I got stuff in storage right now. One one storage a locker to go, and then I'm out of there completely. But anyhow, as far as the magazines and coon hunting stuff, when I quit hunting, well, not quit hunting. When I quit the the books and everything, uh, I put word of mouth out. I called. Two different coon clubs, the nearest ones to me, Blairsville, which is 50 mile away, and Laurelville. Laurelville's only 14 mile from me. And I told them, I said, hey, boys, you want these trophies? They're just like my wife used to say, dust catchers. I oh, said, yeah. That's, uh, it was a thrill when you first won the first couple, <laughs> and that soon wore off. And, uh, yep. I said, you could use them for club hunts. I don't care what. I said, I got probably 40 that are over four foot tall. And Blairsville yeah. came down and got, I don't know how many they took, but uh, probably at least 100. Laurelville did the same. I threw, I threw 650 in the dumpster. That's God's truth. And uh, wow. I had trophies that, Oh, you you don't realize you got them till you start getting rid of them or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. And uh, but like I say, they're nice to look at, and I give a lot to relatives. My aunts say, "Oh, they thought they were so beautiful," and that. Well, <laughs> when you start dusting them every uh, week and so forth, you soon find out they ain't all they're made out to be. But it is a thrill when them anybody would. Uh, be lying if they denied that. Uh, we all like to win, and but after a while, it just becomes a, a bit of a burden. And uh, well, that's I true. still go to a hunt occasionally. In fact, Patty called me today. She said, "Are you going to go to a hunt?" I says, 
I give you my book. I says, where's the hunt at this week? She said, there ain't none next week, but there is, or this week, but there's one next week. And she told me where it was. I said, yeah, I'll be there. I got a dog that he just needs one win. And I might as well at least get that on him while he's living. And uh, so yeah. I like it, the, the meeting all the old guys, especially the old timers and that. Uh, here's a guy from West Virginia. I don't know if you know him or not because he's, but he is a red bone man, but he's from West Virginia. The nicest guy you'll ever meet and most honest guy you'll ever He's dead now. He died this past year. Uh, Bill Shervant. You ever meet him? Yes, I have. And uh, I met him up it, around it, Clarksburg. Where uh, in Clarksburg years ago. Yeah. Uh, I he, used to make the hunts up that way before okay. before Gary I went Davis, to UKC. Gary Davis country. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he, he was a nice guy. He bought a lot of dogs off me, and I ain't saying that because he bought a lot of dogs. But he had come up with, up with me three or four times a year. And uh, you'd never hear Bill say something bad about anybody even if they were bad, he, but he was a true gentleman. And uh, me and uh, Bernie Grinchick went down to the funeral when he was laid out down there. Well, you know, those uh, those people like that are, are what I call the salt of the earth people, and they've Few been in the back. Few and far. Yeah. Few and far. Yeah, absolutely. Fred, we're going to uh, have to cut this one short. Uh, we've uh, talked here for about uh, almost 14 minutes, but we're going to be recording some more, so I want you to stick with me. But as uh, I always say at the end of every podcast, uh, friends, if somebody asks you where I am, where's that Steve Field or that, uh, that old coon hunter, you just tell him he's gone to the dogs. Uh, I'll remember that. 